Back in her apartment, Delilah set Ella on her nightstand under her white ginger jar lamp. Ella, with her poofy dress all fluffed up and spread out around her, looked good there, content even. Actually, she looked a little pleased with herself, which of course... Uh, which was, of course, a pro of projection because Ella wasn't even aware of herself. It was Delilah who was pleased with herself. She was proud of finding a way to turn the day around. She'd gotten past her funk. That was pretty impressive. Delilah checked her watch and set Ella's clock to match that time. It was barely 11.30am, so Delilah was going to be able to grab a couple hours of sleep. Setting Ella's alarm for 1.35pm... Delilah smoothed her sheets and blanket and lay down on top of them, pulling up the comforter to her chin, not because it was cold in her apartment, but because it made her feel secure. Thankful that Mary was either asleep herself, was running out of, uh, was out of running errands, or had ruined her vocal cords with too much singing, Delilah lay back and let herself ride the currents of drowsiness into blissful unconsciousness. The phone blasted through Delilah's peace, like a rocket shattering mon monastery walls. She shot upright and grabbed for her phone, chastising herself for not shutting it off so her nap wouldn't be interrupted. What? She, she snarled, sorry. Where the hell are you? Nate snarled right back. Huh? It's... Delilah looked at Ella. Ella's clock read 2.25pm. Oh crap. You better be here in 15 minutes or don't ever be here again. Delilah pulled the phone from her ear just in time to avoid the clap she knew was coming. Nate used an old-fashioned corded phone, the kind with the metal hook for the receiver. He expressed himself via the force with, with which he replaced the phone on its hook after a call. He was pissed. Delilah ran into her bathroom, tearing off her clothes as she went. She splashed water on her face. Running a brush through her hair, she trotted back into the bedroom, yanked on her dark blue uniform dress and grabbed her work shoes. Ugly black nose slips. Nate made all the... Oh, sorry. Ugly black nose slips Nate made all the employees wear. As she laced them up, her gaze landed on Ella. Well, you're a disappointment, she told the doll. Ella looked back at her through thick lashes. One of her curls had fallen over an eye. She almost looked mischievous. No wonder the doll was so cheap. The only thing that worked was the clock in the middle of Ella's chest. But without the fire, uh, fire? But without the alarm function, what good was the clock? Ella was still a pretty doll, and she still looked like Delilah's long-desired baby, but now she was a, more a reminder of Delilah's frustration than anything else. Finishing with her shoes, Delilah snatched Ella from the nightstand. For a second, she marveled at the realism of Ella's baby-soft skin, but then she strode into the living room, grabbed her purse, and headed out the door. Jogging down the hall to the stairs, Delilah shook her head when she heard Mary belt out, I love the big, bright world. Outside, the sun had seeded the sky to a ceiling of low-hanging clouds spitting fat raindrops. Delilah paused to hold the door open for two elderly ladies who took an excruciatingly long time to go inside. Then she tore around the side of the building, heading for the dumpsters. Three green hulking dumpsters sat like a trio of trolls at the edge of the apartment building's parking lot. Two were open, one was closed. Delilah aimed toward the second open dumpster, and she swung Ella in an arc, releasing Ella's hand at the apex of the curve. Ella flew through the intermittent precipitation and landed with a reverberating metallic thud in one of the open dumpsters. Delilah winced a little at the sound, feeling guilty for tossing out a doll that looked just like her baby, a doll with surprisingly real feeling hands. Delilah didn't see which dumpster Ella landed in because Nate appeared in the diner's back doorway. Delilah waved at him. You late because you were playing with your dolly, he called out. Very funny. Delilah ran toward the diner and reached the door just as the raindrops turned into rain sheets. Nate stepped back to let her by, then closed the door on what was now a downpour. Delilah got a whiff of Nate's aftershave, a subtle scent of whiskey, which he was inaud inordinately proud of. Manny, don't you think? he asked the first time he tried the new product. Delilah had to admit it was. Defying the stereotype of the typical diner owner, Nate was tall, fit, good-looking, and well-groomed. About 50, he had short, graying black hair and a tidy, close-trimmed uh, tr close beard. 
He also had pewter grey eyes that could impale you with his displeasure. He was aiming those eyes at Delilah now. You're lucky you're good and the customers love you, he said, but you need to get a handle on your tardiness. I can't let you slide forever. I know, I know, I'm trying. That you are. Delilah's shift went quickly. That was the upside of working the 2 to 10. The rush could kick your butt, but at least time flew by. Delilah got back to her apartment about 10.30pm, thankfully missing one of Mary's goodnight songs. The building was pretty quiet. All Delilah could hear was rap music coming from one of the apartments at the end of the hall and the sound of laughter coming from a TV on the floor above. Closing her door on what smelled like burnt Brussels sprouts, Delilah hoped the noxious odour wouldn't follow her, and it didn't. Her apartment smelled like pine cleaner and oranges. It smelled better than Delilah, who smelled like grease as she always did at the end of a shift. Peeling off her clothes, she deposited them inside the... I, I can never say this word. Uh, cheddar. <laughs> See, um... Uh, no, I... Uh, there's like... Uh, there's a way to say it, but I, I cannot think of it right now. I'm sorry. Uh, inside the chest that sat by her door. The chest, combined with a charcoal air purifying bag tucked inside of it, solved the grease smell problem she'd had for weeks when she first got the diner job. In the shower, Delilah washed off the rest of the grease smell. Then she pulled on a long, uh, a red long-sleeved nightshirt and settled in bed with half a container of beef stro stroganoff and green beans. The cook who worked the 2 to 10 shift was the best one Nate had. The stroganoff was great. While she ate, Delilah watched the rerun of a comedy show on the old TV sitting on top of her antique maple dresser. The show didn't make her laugh. It didn't even make her smile. It just helped her feel less lonely when she ate. About 10.30pm, Delilah set her empty styrofoam container atop a pile of home decor magazines on her nightstand. She turned off her ginger lamp and curled up on her side. The streetlights that hovered over the parking lot outside cast sinister distorted shadows throughout her room. They looked like giant bony fingers reaching toward the bed. Delilah closed her eyes and willed sleep to come quickly, which it did. It ended just as quickly. Delilah's eyes shot open. Her non-alarm clock's uh, lit face told her it was 1.35am. She sat up and looked around. What had awakened her? Looking toward her window, she rubbed her eyes. It had been a sound, some kind of intrusive sound coming from outside her window. Had it been a ringing sound? A buzzing sound? Delilah tilted her head, listening. She could hear nothing but the whoosh of cars on the road. She looked back at the clock. It was now 1.36am. Wait, she'd awoken at 1.35am. She'd set the doll's alarm for 1.35. What if she'd missed the AM-PM settings? Oops, she whispered. Sorry, Ella. Delilah thought about going outside to retrieve the possibly still working doll, but she was too tired. She'd look in the morning. Delilah snuggled under the covers and went back to sleep. You threw it away? Harper drew in her chin, raised an eyebrow, and quirked her mouth in her what were you thinking expression. I thought it was broken. Yeah, but it could be a collectible. It could be worth something. Harper's huge blue eyes lit up at the idea of dollar signs. Delilah could almost see a calculator totaling imaginary amounts in Harper's mind. Delilah and Harper sat at an elevated round table in Harper's favourite espresso place. Delilah sipped cinnamon tea. Harper was drinking some kind of fancy quadruple espresso. Harper was addicted to coffee. The espresso place was a brick-walled narrow space with lots of stainless steel and chrome and very little wood. And just before 11am, it wasn't very crowded. A dark-skinned woman with pigtails sat at one table, concentrating on whatever was on her laptop, and an elderly man munched on a muffin while reading the paper. Behind the counter, machines fizzed and spit. Haven't I told you anything? Harper asked. Always try to sell it before you toss it, remember? I was late for work. I was a little stressed. You need to learn to meditate. Then I'd miss work because I got lost in meditation. Harper laughed, and everyone else in the place turned to look at her. Harper's laugh was just... was like a resounding sea lion bark. You could tell how funny she thought something was by the number of barks. Delilah's comment warranted just one. I'm really sorry, I haven't had my, uh, <laughs> my video recording on, so you haven't been able to see any of the... any of the words, but, um... We continue. <laughs>
this keeps happening to me. I, I keep forgetting to switch to um, screen record mode. Anyway, um, how do you like the new play? Delilah asked. It's yippy skippy fun. My lines are all crap, but I love, love my character. Delilah smiled. Harper had been Delilah's best friend for almost six years, ever since the two girls landed in foster care together. Determined that the foster home would be their last, they teamed up to help each other survive the regi regimented structure imposed by Gerald, the ex-military husband of the couple who'd taken them in. Whenever Gerald admonished uh, them for not adhering to his schedule, reminding them that this had to happen at 500... or is that of time? 5 o'clock... And that to happen at 6, 10, Harper would mumble something like, and you can jump off a cliff at I'll, use, I'll screw you 100. She made Delilah laugh, which helped her survive. Complete opposites in both looks and personality, Harper and Delilah would probably have never been friends if they hadn't been thrown in some scheduling hell together. However, they made their friendship work. When Harper announced her mischievous plan for getting a famous playwright to cast her in his plays, Delilah just said, be safe. When Delilah said she was going to marry her knight in shining armour and have babies, Harper just said, don't sign a priya, a prenup. I don't know what that word means. Uh, Harper's followed Delilah's advice and had the grace to not to say, I told you so, when Delilah failed to follow hers. I think you should look for her, Harper said. What? Ella, I think you should look for her. Harper toyed with one of the dozen or so blonde braids she had coiled around her head. Wearing heavy, colourful makeup and a skin-tight green dress, she had an exotic Medusa look going on. Because she might be worth something, Delilah nodded. It's not just that. You said she looked like the baby you thought you were going to have. That's a pretty bizarre thing, don't you think? That you'd find a doll that looks like this imaginary baby. What if she's some kind of sign? You know I don't believe in signs, maybe you should. Delilah shrugged, and they spent the rest of their visit talking about Harper's play and Harper's latest boyfriend. Then they reminded each other, as they always did, of the hell they'd escaped. No, you cannot use the bathroom, not until 9.45. That's your scheduled time to urinate, Harper intoned. She did great imp impersonations, and she had Gerald nailed. She could also eerily mimic the alarm Gerald used to signal every scheduled event in the household. The alarm was a sort of cross between a ring, a buzz, and a siren. Delilah always covered her ears when Harper felt compelled to impersonate it. Richard once asked Delilah why she and Harper needed to relive their past regularly. Uh, she said, it reminds us of how good things are now, even when they seem not so good. Anything is better than living with Gerald. As it always did when Delilah and Harper were together, time disappeared. When Delilah went out to her car, she realised she barely had time to get home and get changed before her shift. Why are you being so nice to me? Delilah asked Nate when she arrived for her 2 to 10. She stood in front of the schedule posted on the bulletin board in the employee break room. Nate had scheduled Delilah for the 2 to 10 shift for a full week in a row. She couldn't remember the last time she had worked the same shift for a week. And this shift was especially good right now because as long as she went to bed within a couple of hours after ending her shift, she'd wake up in plenty of time for work. She wouldn't even need an alarm clock. She could put up with the evening rush in exchange for decent sleep. Nate looked up from doing his daily paperwork at the round table by the bulletin board. It's in my best interests. I like it when you show up on time for work. Well, it's easier to show up on time when my body can figure out what time it is, Delilah said. Wuss, slave driver, whiner, meanie. Delilah started her shift as close to happy as she'd been in some time. Work was going well. When Nate teased, Nate was happy. When Nate was happy, things ran smoothly. Delilah had such a good time at work that she came back to the apartment in a good mood. She ate meatloaf and broccoli in a good mood, and she went to sleep in a good mood. The good mood disappeared, though, when she sat up in her bed, her muscles rigid, listening. Who was whispering? Someone was whispering. Delilah could hear indecipherable, sibilant words coming from... Fr from where? Wide awake, she looked at her clock. It was 1.35am. Again? Delilah strained to understand the whispers, but they stopped. Now all she could hear were the cars on the road. Where did that whispering come from? Ella. It had to be. Harper was right. Delilah should have looked for Ella. She 
should have checked, not because Ella might have been valuable or because she was assigned, but because apparently her alarm was still going off at 1.35am. But Delilah still hadn't, uh, but sorry, but Delilah hadn't had time before she went to work. She'd check today for sure. She couldn't believe Ella's alarm was so powerful she could hear it from here, but then again, wasn't Mary's singing enough painful proof of the apartment's thin walls? Delilah lay back down and closed her eyes. Ella's face filled her inner vision. Delilah opened her eyes. She sat up again. I'm not going to go and get any sleep until I find her, she thought. Delilah got up and pulled on sweats. Stuffing her feet in a pair of slip-on clogs, she reached in her nightstand drawer for a flashlight. The dumpsters were well lit, but if Ella was partially buried, Delilah might have trouble spotting her. Throwing on an ugly, multicoloured cardigan Harper had crocheted for her, Delilah left her apartment, went down the silent hallway and stairs and exited the building. Outside, the air was chilly, but the sky was clear. A few stars even managed to shine through the frothy glow of the urban night. Delilah paused just outside the building and looked around to be sure she was alone. She was. Padding around the building, she headed for the dumpsters. The yawning green trash bins sat ugly and under the spotlights of the street lamps and the diner's floodlights. One of the two that had been open before was closed, and the one that had been closed was open. They all looked a little askew, like they'd been moved around. Great. If they'd been moved, finding Ella would be like playing a game of hat trick. This might take longer than Delilah had envisioned. Glancing around again, Delilah shrugged. She might as well get out. She might as well get it over with. Approaching the middle dumpster, the one she thought she'd thrown Ella into, Delilah lifted the lid, stood on her tiptoes, and shone the light down inside. The light landed on a mound of plastic garbage bags, a ratty old blanket, a smattering of takeout containers, and a sprinkling of empty cans. Her light didn't reveal the obnoxious smell of dirty diapers that Delilah's nose discovered as soon as she opened the lid. Delilah gently closed the lid, careful not to let it clang shut. If Ella was in this dumpster, she was buried. Delilah decided she'd rather check out the other two dumpsters first before diving into any of them. So she did her tiptoe light aiming routine first at the open one that she thought had also been open when she chucked Ella into a dumpster. The only thing that set this dumpster apart from the first one Delilah looked at was a couple dozen old paperbacks cascading over the piles of stuffed garbage bags. Delilah was tempted to take one of them, a murder mystery, but it had a, sp a, a suspicious red stain on it. She didn't want to know what the stain was. The last dumpster Delilah checked was the one she was pretty sure had been closed when she tossed away Ella, so she wasn't surprised to find more of the same kind of trash and no sign of Ella. Um, stimmied I don't know what that word means, <laughs> stymied, uh, Delilah turned off her flashlight and thought for a moment. Did she really have to get in these dumpsters and dig for Ella? She didn't know for sure that it was Ella waking her up. For all she knew, it was Mary singing some dumb middle-of-the-night song or a cat in heat. Yeah, but why did she get awakened precisely at 1.35am, both last night and tonight? Coincidence? It was possible, wasn't it? Harper once went through this period when she kept waking up at 3.33am and then she saw 333 everywhere for a couple of months. Harper researched the number and found out it was some kind of spiritual sign. What if 135 was a spiritual sign just for Delilah? She snorted and turned her back on the dumpsters. Now she was just being silly. She headed back to the front of the building. She'd stick with a con coincidence theory for now. It was easier and less smelly than assuming Ella was the problem. The coincidence explanation got strained when Delilah awoke at 1.35am for the third night in a row. This time, she was sure there had been a sound against her window. Had it been a scratching sound? A tapping? Whatever it was, it had been ominous enough that Delilah immediately grabbed her flashlight and aimed it at her blinds. Then after staring at, an, at her unmoving blinds for a minute, she got up the courage to tiptoe across the room and look behind them. Nothing was at the window, and down below in the parking lot, the dumpsters hadn't moved from the positions they'd been in the night before. Delilah blew out air. She was going to have to search every one of these dumpsters. Should she wait for daylight? That would make it easier, wouldn't it? 
And if someone asked what she was doing, she'd answer truthfully that she threw out ev that she threw out something she shouldn't have thrown out. Delilah left the window and took a step toward her bed. She stopped. What day was it? Working all sorts of weird shifts. Delilah rarely knew what day of the week it was. She thought for a second. Wednesday. Well, crap, she grumbled. The dumpsters were emptied on Thursday mornings early. If she waited, Ella would be gone. But wait, that was a good thing, right? If Ella was gone, her alarm couldn't go off and wake up Delilah. Delilah didn't think Ella was worth anything, and she was sure Ella's resemblance to Emma was a fluke. There was no reason why Delilah should have to climb through stinky trash. She could just let the garbage truck take her problem away. Delilah smiled and got back in bed. Thursday night, or rather Friday early morning, Delilah's eyes opened to see 1.35am. Again. She was immediately fully alert. Her heart beat loudly, fast, and steady like a driving beat on a timpani. This manic pace wasn't... Wait. Wasn't up Delilah. Okay. I I think there's a, been a little bit skipped, but whatever. Um, Delilah didn't think Ella was worth anything, and she was sure Ella's resemblance to Emma was a fluke. Oh, never mind. Sorry. It, it, the, the page is weird thing. Um, but yeah, it was also a reaction to Delilah's disturbingly strong feeling that something was under her bed. Something was moving under her bed. But that couldn't be. Could it? Delilah listened. She didn't hear anything at first, but then she wondered if she was hearing a scuttling sound on the carpet under her bed. She sat up and started to swing a leg over the side of the bed. She stopped. What if something was under there? It could grab her foot. Quickly pulling her foot back under the covers, Delilah reached out and turned on her nightstand lamp. As soon as her room was lit, she leaned over and checked the floor all around her bed. She saw nothing but the tan and cream coloured carpet she'd gotten at a yard sale. She'd just imagined the sound. Or something was still under her bed. Delilah reached for the nightstand drawer. She grabbed her flashlight, turned it on, took a deep breath, then hung over the bed and shined the light beneath it. Nothing was there. Okay. This was getting crazy. It was four nights in a row. It had to be Ella. But the dumpsters had been emptied. Delilah crossed her legs and rubbed her arms. They were covered with goosebumps. What if the trash collectors didn't, didn't completely empty the dumpsters? Or what if Ella fell out as the bin was being emptied? Delilah had to check, and she had to check now. She needed to know. So, repeating her steps from two nights before, Delilah went out to the dumpsters with her flashlight. Tonight, they were all closed. They usually were after trash pickup on Thursdays. Delilah approached the dumpsters in order from right to left. She lifted three lids and shined her light into three nearly empty bins. All she found were two bags of household trash, a bag of, di uh, of dirty diapers and its corresponding nasty odour, a broken lamp and a sad pile of old men's clothing. The only thing that could have hidden Ella was the pile of clothing, so Delilah, holding her breath, hung over the edge of the dumpster that had the clothing and used her flashlight to poke around in the pile. The only thing under the, uh, under the clothes were more clothes. Delilah picked her way between the dumpsters and around the area surrounding them. She shined her flashlight into every dark nook or cranny she'd spotted. No Ella. The doll was gone, for sure. She wasn't here. She couldn't be what was waking Delilah up at 1.35am. So what was? Delilah woke up at 10.10 the next morning, and the first thing she did when she got up, besides covering her ears so she wouldn't hear Mary singing about dusting books, was call Harper and ask her to come by. She woke her, uh, Harper up, but Harper never let stuff like that bother her. Sure, I'll be there in a bit, she chirped. When Harper arrived, she dropped her voluminous sack-style leather purse on the floor, flopped onto the love seat, and said, What's the problem? How do you know there's a problem? Delilah sat down next to her. You don't normally ask me to come over. Oh yeah. Delilah had basically summoned her friend. That showed how rattled she was. I have a question, Delilah said. Must be a good one. Did you rescue Ella from the dumpster yesterday? What? Mary sang out, Because I feel fizzy, yay! <laughs> Harper grinned. She liked Mary's songs. The doll. Ella. Did you get her out of the dumpster? Harper ruffled her eyebrows. Why would I do that? You said she could be worth something. Well, she could, but she's your doll, not mine. 
I was going to look for her, I'd tell you. Delilah rubbed her face with her hands. Yeah, she should have known that. Why are you asking? Did you look and not find her? Yeah, I looked, sort of. I didn't dig through the trash, but then the dumpsters were emptied. Okay, so Ella is gone. What's the big? Delilah hadn't told Harper about being wakened at 1.35am every morning. She just told her about finding the doll and throwing it out when it didn't work. She couldn't think of a way to tell Harper about waking up at the same time four nights in a row without sounding like she was overreacting. Besides, Harper would just talk about signs again if Delilah told her. Since I'm here, you want to go get some lunch? Harper asked. Delilah waved goodbye to Harper with relief. She was glad the lunch was over because in the middle of it she'd come up with an idea. Now she could finally act on it. Pointing her car in the direction of the newer neighbourhood with the runty cherry trees, she went in search of the house where she'd found the garage sale, and Ella. She planned to get some answers about the doll from the doll's previous owner. Without signs to direct her, Delilah missed a turn and had to backtrack. Eventually, though, she pulled up in front of the Spanish-style house where she'd met Mumford, the friendly chihuahua. But Mumford wasn't home. Nobody was. Even though Delilah could see from the street that the bare windows revealed vacant rooms in the house, she pulled into the empty driveway and got out of her car. Inhaling the still humid air, she wrinkled her nose at the smell that reminded her of rotting leaves. Um, the neighbourhood was unusually silent. The only thing she heard was a lone dog barking in the distance. This was the house, wasn't it? She studied it, then turned and looked at the surrounding houses. Yes, this was it. Weird, she said out loud. But was it? After all, the woman who'd lived here had been having a garage sale. People did that before they moved, right? Delilah couldn't read anything into the fact that there was no trace of anyone or anything at this place where she found Ella. So why did it feel pretentious? Hoping she might stumble over some clue to where Mumford and the woman with the spiky hair might have gone, Delilah circled the house and peeked in windows. She found nothing. The house was completely empty for a single wadded up paper towel on the counter in the kitchen. All Delilah got from her exploration was a creepy coil of unease that wrapped itself around her chest and didn't leave, even after she practically ran to her car and drove away as fast as she could.